Okay, okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Gangadhar Sansuddhi from Kolapur. The topic which I am going to discuss is about embryology and a part of neuroanatomy. As far as exams are concerned, or as far as anatomy paper is concerned, we do not get a long question on embryology and neuroanatomy. But generally, we get short notes on both the topics. But as far as practical is concerned, both the things are very important. And accordingly, I have chosen a few topics of embryology and the neuroanatomy to discuss with. Hello, yes, am I audible? Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, the <clears throat> first we'll start with the embryology topic. And the first topic I want to discuss is the fertilization. The fertilization, you get a short note, as well as this is very much important as far as the, the practical is concerned. Now, the question asked is define fertilization one mention the steps of fertilization, two, and three is what are the effects of fertilization. Now, the definition of the fertilization is it is a process by which the male and female gametes fuse, or in fact, it is the male pronucleus and the female pronucleus unite together. That is what the definition is. And this fertilization takes place in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Now, what are the steps which are occurring in fertilization? First of all, what we see is the ovum from the ovary. It traverses to the ampulla, whereas the sperms are deposited in the vaginal canal. From there, these sperms, which are about 200 to 300 million in number, they are sucked by the uterus, and these travel down to the fallopian tube. When they reach the fallopian tube, only about they are about 200 in number, whereas the earlier number was 200, 200 to 300 millions. Now, <clears throat> when they when the sperms reach the ampulla, the three steps are taken. One is the separation of the corona radiata cells. These corona radiata cells are surrounding the secondary oocyte or simply it is called as ovum. The movements of these sperms which reach the corona radiata, they, the movement of the tail displaces the corona radiata. And once the sperm reach the zona pellucida, the zona pellucida is the outermost covering of the secondary oocyte or the ovum. And this zona pellucida and amorphous membrane or amorphous covering, when the sperm, head of the sperm comes in contact with the zona pellucida, the acrosomal cap releases hyaluronic acid and the acrosome in enzyme which dissolve the zona pellucida. And after the dissolution of the zona pellucida, the head or the sperm reaches the perivitelline membrane or sorry, vitelline membrane of the secondary oocyte. Here, the plasma membrane fuses with the vitelline membrane, perivitelline, or sorry, vitelline membrane, and the head enters into the secondary oocyte. Now, that is as far as the step number three is concerned. Once the head, which is nothing but it is the condensed chromatin network or chromatin material, this enters into the secondary oocyte. The, it forms the male pronucleus, and the nucleus of the secondary oocyte gets organized into
gets organized <coughs> into the female pronucleus and these two unite together to form what is known as the zygote and this is how the fertilization takes place once the sperm enters the the secondary oocyte the zona pellucida becomes impermeable because of the zonal reaction and also once it the sperm enters into the cytoplasm of the secondary oocyte there is a calcium surge which makes the vitelline membrane impermeable to the further entry of the sperms that is how that is how the fertilization takes place now what are the effects of this fertilization or what are the results of this fertilization why does this fertilization take place and what is the purpose of it the effect of fertilization the first one <clears throat> the first one is to see that the diploid number of chromosomes are restored one second thing is formation of the ovum that is when the ovum is released into the female fallopian tube it is in the form of secondary oocyte as the sperm enters into the secondary oocyte the second meiotic division takes place and the second polar body is extruded into the perivitelline space that is the second result what is seen the third one it is the effect of the fertilization is the determination of the sex and the <clears throat> next one is it is the initiation of the cleavage the zygote is a single cell which is present within the zona pellucida this zygote goes on multiplying giving rise to number of daughter cells these daughter cells later on they are going to form the embryo embryo and the related structures and the last result what we find is the <clears throat> change of the species you see the union of the chromatin material union of chromatin material from the father as well as the mother it results in the variation of the species because of the change in the chromatin material this is what we are supposed to write this is what we are supposed to write in when the question of fertilization comes the next question is generally a short note comes and what is known as a yolk sac for the student a yolk sac is a generally he thinks the yolk sac contains yolk and that is for nourishment of the embryo it is very correct as far as the lower animals are concerned whereas in human beings the yolk sac carries out number of different important functions rather than becoming a source of nourishment this yolk sac what is it first what is the yolk sac what is the process of formation of the yolk sac and what are the functions of the yolk sac these three things we are going to see the first thing is what is yolk sac yolk sac is an endodermal an an endodermal sac which is present ventral to the developing germ disk or the bilaminar embryo we say now this yolk sac <clears throat> is generally described under three headings the three headings are one the primary yolk sac two the secondary yolk sac and three the tertiary yolk sac the primary yolk sac is the one <clears throat> which is seen soon after the blastocyst is formed the blastocyst <clears throat> the cells of the blastocyst or what we call them as blastomeres they get arranged in a two layers outer and inner inner layer is the one which we call it as the inner cell mass or these are the ones which are known as embryogenic cells these embryogenic cells later they get arranged into different germ layers the first germ layer which is formed is the endoderm and this endoderm certain cells 
which are derived from these endodermal cells, they line the inner surface of the cytotrophoblast. And these flattened endodermal cells are known as the, they are forming what is known as the Husserl's membrane. So a sac is formed, which is the floor of which is formed by Husserl's membrane and the roof of which is formed by the endoderm. And this sac is known as the primary yolk sac. Later, the cytotrophoblast, these cells, they multiply and these cells are laid inside and these cells are forming what is known as the extra embryonic mesoderm. And this extra embryonic mesoderm later differentiates into splanchnopleuric and the somatopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm with the appearance of a cavity which is known as extra embryonic coelom. And when this extra embryonic coelom appears, the size of the yolk sac is reduced. And thus reduced yolk sac now is termed as the secondary yolk sac. Now, <clears throat> the bilaminar germ disc later, this is the bilaminar germ disc we have got. Later, it's converted into trilaminar germ disc. And the amniotic cavity, which is formed by the ectoderm on one side and the amniogenic cells on the other side, it enlarges enormously so that as it enlarges enormously, it encloses a part of the yolk sac within the developing embryo and a part of the yolk sac, a part of the yolk sac lies outside and a part of it is pinched by the amniotic cavity. The pinched part of the yolk sac is known as vitellointestinal duct. The part which is caught within the embryo is forming what is known as the, the, the primitive gut. And the part which is lying outside is known as the tertiary yolk sac or definitive yolk, definitive yolk sac. This is how the yolk sac develops. And this is how we are supposed to write in the exam. And now what are the... <clears throat> functions of this yolk sac. One, it is a hemopoietic organ in the initial development or yes, in the initial development of the embryo. Later on, the function of the hemopiasis is taken up by the liver of the embryo. That is one. The second thing is it forms part of the gut tube I said. That is what I said. The folding, this is the folding of the embryo. And because of the folding of the embryo, the part of the yolk sac is caught between and caught within the folding of embryo and that forms the gut tube. And the, that is the second function we have got. The third function, what we have got is a very important one is it forms or it produces primitive germ cells, which are known as the spermatogonia and the oogonia. Now, next to it, what we find is within the embryo, the yolk sac sends a diverticulum which enters into the connecting stock. This is the connecting stock I am pointing at. And this diverticulum, which is known as allantoic diverticulum, is the one which is going to form part of the urinary bladder. And also it is the one where the Angiobla, angel, uh, the um, vascular tissue of the embryo, that is the umbilical vessels, are going to develop. And that is the importance of the allantois we have got. So when asked what are the functions of the yolk sac, these four functions we have got to mention. And last one, if at all, is a partial, uh, the temporary nourishment of the embryo which is not of that importance. Now that is as far as the yolk sac is concerned. <clears throat> the third one, which I have chosen is the placenta. Now, <clears throat> what are the headings under which we study this? The placenta, first thing is, what is placenta? Two, what is placental barrier? Three, what are the structures of the 
what are the structures which are forming the placental barrier what is the purpose of the placental barrier and third one what are the functions of the placenta and last one is what are the anomalies of the placenta now this placenta a uh, matured full term placenta is defined as a discoid structure it is a discoid structure which is made up of compact vascular tissue that is the definition of the full term placenta we got the type of placenta we say it is hemochorial hemochorial in the sense there are different types of placenta depending upon the uh, blood of the mother and the fetus how these two bloods are separated from each other the in human beings this placenta is known as hemochorial this is so because the placenta is forming what are known as chorionic villi and within this chorionic villi we find fetal blood vessels and these chorionic villi are these chorionic villi are floating in a space which is known as intervill space and within this intervill space the blood the maternal blood is circulating so that there are certain structures which are present between the the the, the fetal blood vessels and the maternal blood vessels or maternal blood rather and these chorionic villi as they are separating as they are coming in contact with the maternal blood the type of placenta which is described is hemochorial type it is also described as fetal maternal organ this is so because the, this is formed partly by mother the contribution is coming from mother and partly it is from fetus that's all as far as the definition of the placenta is concerned now what is the gross anatomy of placenta this gross fully matured placenta it is a discoid in shape one second it is about 15 to 20 cm in a diameter two three is it is about 500 g in weight and this has got two surfaces the two surfaces one surface is rough and another one is smooth the rough surface is known as the maternal surface this maternal surface is rough it is divided into number of about 15 to 20 lobes which it is given as it resembles a cobblestone appearance whatever it is it is okay if you remember ki it is rough in outline and it shows about 15 to 20 lobes which are known as cotyledons whereas the fetal surface which is smooth and shining and this is covered by amniotic membrane and the um, yeah, the umbilical blood vessels are entering through this surface that is as far as the gross surface is concerned gross anatomy is concerned now uh, what is placental membrane or placental barrier very commonly asked and what is its function now i said the placenta is made up of number of projections which are known as chorionic villi these chorionic villi have got a set of structures within and this chorionic villus comes in contact with the intervillous space present within the uterus within the endometrium of the uterus which contains the maternal blood now how is this chorionic villus is formed the, there are different stages of chorionic villi the different stages are the first it is formed as primary villus second it is the secondary villus and third is tertiary tertiary villus or the definitive chorionic villus the structure of the chorionic villus tertiary is this is the one which is showing it one it is a transverse section of the chorionic tertiary chorionic villus which is showing the outermost is the uh, jelly like mass of cells known as the in situ trophoblast next to the in situ trophoblast we have got a layer of cells single layer of cells which are known as the cytotrophoblast which are resting on a basement membrane 
next to this we have got a core of tissue which is made up of extra embryonic mesoderm and within this extra embryonic mesoderm we find these fetal capillaries blood vessels which are made up of simple squamous epithelium resting on the basement membrane resting on the basement membrane within which the fetal blood is flowing so surrounding this chorionic villus you find the maternal blood and within this fetal capillary you find this fetal blood so all these structures all these structures which are separating the fetal blood from the maternal blood are forming what is known as placental barrier or placental membrane this is required the purpose behind this is like it is the one which permits or it is the one which decides what is required for the fetus and what is useful for the fetus and what is harmful for the fetus accordingly this placental membrane or placental barrier admits or stops the things entering now <clears throat> how is this i repeat again placental membrane what are the structures which are forming the placental membrane or placental barrier one is this syncytiotrophoblast i am coming from outwards to within then we have got the cytotrophoblast with the basement membrane then we have got the extra embryonic mesoderm and then we have got the simple squamous epithelium of the fetal blood ca capillaries with the basement membrane of this these are the constituents which are forming the placental membrane now what are the functions of this placenta <clears throat> number of functions the placenta carries out one is the exchange of gases oxygen and carbon dioxide two transport of nutrients three is we have got the it acts as a kidney so excretion of waste material four transmission of antibodies the antibodies which are formed in the mother are transported to the fetus five by it acts as a barrier barrier in the sense it prevents the entry of the organisms the virus also the toxins also it prevents the entry of certain maternal hormones which are known as the thyroxin thyroid hormone or acth which might affect the fetus adversely then we have got what is known as it secretes it is an endocrine organ also it secretes progesterone which helps in maintenance of the pregnancy it helps in it secretes estrogen which also is the one which helps in the development of the mammary glands and all that it also secretes human chorionic gonadotrophin now the last one it acts as a storehouse also storehouse for glucose and storehouse for calcium and storehouse for iron before the liver takes the role of storage that is as far as what we know about the functions of the placenta <coughs> now a short note often comes as an anomalies of placenta so the question here is the placenta can be asked in three ways or else in oral also it is asked first it may be asked as a gross structure a full term placenta one second the question you might come across is what is known as the placental barrier or three the question might come as the anomalies of the placenta number of anomalies of placenta are there the first anomaly the first one is depending upon the attachment or adherence of the chorionic villi where they are attached known as placenta accreta if it is attached to the periphery of the myometrium remember the placenta is never entering into the myometrium it is present within the endometrium abnormally it reaches the myometrium that is the anomaly what i am talking about what is known as placenta accreta when it reaches the periphery or outer surface of the myometrium if it reaches the 
enters into the myometrium it is known as the placenta increta and if it goes out of the myometrium also it goes out of the perimetrium it is known as the placenta percreta this is depending upon the adherence of the chorionic villi second heading of the placental anomalies is depending upon the shape and the normal shape is discoidal sometimes instead of one the placenta forms two bidiscoidal more than two multidiscoidal it is spread like a sheet diffuse the placenta is divided into two pieces one small and one large placenta succincturiata you may find a hole an opening a hole within the placenta known as placenta fenestrated placenta and also sometimes within the uterus the placenta gets buried in such a way that it is surrounded by uh, endometrial growth in a circular fashion and that is known as the circumellate papilla this is depending upon the shape now the third one is depending upon the attachment of the umbilical cord generally the umbilical cord is attached to the fetal surface of the placenta nearer to the center and after entering into the placenta it divides but sometimes what happens is the umbilical cord enters through the margin of the placenta which is known as marginal placenta or it is known as the battle door placenta or sometimes <clears throat> the umbilical vessels i said it and the umbilical blood vessels they enter into the placenta and then divide but sometimes the umbilical blood vessels they divide even before they enter into the placenta the term is known as the furcate placenta in the similar fashion the third one where you will find the umbilical cord enters into the membrane nearer to the, that is the chorion and amni amniotic membranes you have got it enters into these membranes and then enters into the margin of the placenta which is known as velamentous insertion this is how the placenta the anomalies we come across depending upon the chorionic villi adherence depending upon the shape and depending upon the attachment of the umbilical cord these are the three questions generally asked separately independently as a short notes now the next one uh, which i have chosen is a very important one no doubt theory wise no doubt the practical wise and for a first bds student the tongue tongue is a very very important organ and not only the development of the tongue the whole tongue all the microscopy development gross anatomy everything is important as far as the first bds student is concerned now this coming here to the development of the tongue a little bit before i go to development of tongue what i want to impress upon is what are known as the pharyngeal arches now these pharyngeal arches are simply some <clears throat> the primitive pharynx which is developing in the region of the neck is a three layered structure it is a three layered tube which is flattened entero posteriorly and this one is a half of the primitive pharynx which is shown here and this three layered tube <clears throat> it shows about six thickenings in an arched fashion that is i said it is a three layer structure outer ectoderm inner endoderm and in between we have got the mesoderm this mesoderm thickens in the form of the pharyngeal rings or the arches and these arches which are nothing but these are the thickenings of the intraembryonic mesoderm covered outside by ectoderm and lined inside by endoderm are known as pharyngeal arches and there are about six pharyngeal arches the fifth one disappears and five of them persist 
and these five pharyngeal arches with the ectoderm with the endoderm and the mesoderm in between they give rise to number of structures of the head neck face one of them is the tongue if a histology of tongue is taken the histology of tongue is studied under or can be studied under three headings or in the, in the same fashion the development also can be studied under three headings one the tongue is covered by the mucous membrane so that is the development of the mucous membrane two the covered covering mucous membrane encloses the muscles these muscles that is the development of the muscles three it contains the connective tissue so what is the development of the connective tissue these are the three headings under which a development of the tongue is studied generally when a student is asked ne tell me the what is the development of the tongue immediately he goes for what is known as anterior two third of the tongue posterior one third of the tongue no doubt but who the next question next question comes as what is what is the what is the structure which is developing from the arch or which structure is developing from the pharyngeal arch he fails to answer to understand this properly what i have done is i have divided the development of tongue into under three headings one mucous membrane two the muscles and three is the connective tissue now <clears throat> these pharyngeal arches which i have shown are showing the development of the mucous membrane of the tongue now, now these arches are labeled as label number 1 first arch second arch third arch fourth arch and sixth arch the fifth arch disappears i said during fourth week of embryonic life in the center of the floor of the primitive pharynx in the region of the first pharyngeal arch a triangular a triangular swelling appears a growth appears which is known as tuberculum impar tuberculum impar tuberculum elevation impar unpaired on either side of this tuberculum impar on either side of the midline we find two endodermal swellings these two endodermal swellings are known as the lingual swellings now the two lingual swellings and the tuberculum impar they are present in the first pharyngeal arch immediately behind the tuberculum impar we find a small depression that a depression is known as the foramen cecum this foramen cecum is nothing but it is the beginning of the development of the thyroid gland and behind this related to the second third and fourth a median swelling is seen which is known as hypobranchial eminence or okay it is known as hypobranchial eminence and these four structures the two lingual swellings the tuberculum impar and this hypobranchial eminence these are the structures which form the mucous membrane of the tongue how the yes hello am i audible to you please hello yes sir yes sir continue am i audible yes yes sir shall i continue yes sir please continue okay ma'am thank you ma'am now here what is shown is the two lingual swellings and tuberculum impar the two lingual swellings increase in size they they overlap the tuberculum impar and they join together and the joining of these two tuberculum sorry the lingual swellings this forms the mucous membrane of the anterior two third of the tongue the junction of the right and left lingual swellings is marked by a midline sulcus behind we find the hypobranchial eminence this hypobranchial eminence is divisible into two parts the cranial part and the caudal part to understand this i would divide this as second the cranial part is coming from second pharyngeal arch and third pharyngeal arch the caudal part is coming from the fourth pharyngeal arch now the part which is labeled as cranial part or i said the part which is coming from the second and third 
out of this the mucous membrane which is belonging to the third arch it overrides the second arch and it joins the anterior two third of the tongue the junction of this anterior two third of the tongue with the cranial part of the hypobronchial eminence is marked by a v-shaped depression which is known as sulcus terminalis the apex of which is marked by foramen cecum now <clears throat> the most posterior part that is the caudal part of the hypobronchial eminence which is belonging to the fourth arch now forms the posterior most part of the tongue so in a way what we can say is the mucous membrane of the tongue develops anterior to third develops from the first pharyngeal arch endoderm the posterior one third of the tongue mucous membrane develops from the third arch whereas the posterior most part of the tongue develops from fourth arch this is how this is how the tongue develops this is the figure where it is shown that this one is the part which is developing from the first arch this is the part which is second arch and this is this is the part of the hypobronchial eminence and the part which is belonging to the third arch i said it overrides and the second arch is excluded out from the development of the tongue now that is as far as the mucous membrane is concerned now the muscles which are striated muscles they are not developing from the local source they are coming from some different source and that source is known as somites and these somites are nothing but these are the parts of the what are known as paraglial mesoderm the somites which are developing in the region of the head are known as occipital somites the muscles which are developing from these occipital somites are known as occipital myotomes and the three or four occipital myotomes they unite together and these this muscle mass which is a developed derived from occipital myotomes that migrates from the region of the head to the developing tongue each each myotome has got its own nerve and these nerves three four myotomes having three four somatic nerves all of them they unite together to form one nerve which is known as hypoglossal nerve that is why we say all the muscles of the tongue are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve that is the development of the muscles of the tongue the third one is the development of connective tissue and this development of connective tissue which is present within the tongue is derived from the local mesoderm which is present within the first pharyngeal arch that is how the tongue develops that is how the development of the tongue has to be written but the question comes as not only this write the development of the tongue but the question comes as the development write the development of the tongue with the correlation of its nerve supply now i said there are six pharyngeal arches the fifth one disappears fifth one disappears now each pharyngeal arch has got its own nerve and that nerve which is belonging to that particular arch is known as a post traumatic nerve now for example when you take the first arch mandibular nerve is the post traumatic nerve when you take second arch it is the facial nerve when you take third arch it is the glossopharyngeal nerve when you take fourth arch it is the superior laryngeal nerve a branch of the vagus now <clears throat> sometimes a few of the arches have got an additional nerve which is coming from the next arch that is for example the first arch will contain its own nerve also and it will contain a branch which is coming from the second arch also that is known as the pre traumatic nerve so in the first arch what we find is the first arch is, is made up of two nerves one is post traumatic which we call it as mandibular nerve and 
the pre-traumatic, which is known as corridor tympani. So these two nerves we have got, and the, we say anterior two third of the tongue develops from the two lingual swellings and tuberculum impar, which is belonging to the first arch. That is why we say the for the anterior two third mucous membrane is supplied by mandibular nerve and the corda tympani. That is as far as the spatial as well as general nerve, general as well as the spatial nerve supply is concerned. In the similar fashion, I said posterior to one third of the tongue is developing from two sources. One source is the part of the cranial part of the hypobranchial eminence, which is derived from the third arch. And the nerve of the third arch is the glossopharyngeal nerve. That is why the mucous membrane of the posterior one third of the tongue, both general sensory as well as the spatial sensory is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Whereas I said the posterior most part of the mucous membrane of the tongue is developing from the fourth arch hypobronchial, belonging to the hypobronchial, I mean hypobronchial eminence caudal part. And that is why the most posterior part is, is supplied by internal laryngeal nerve, which in turn is a branch of superior laryngeal. That is the branch of the vagus. Simply it is described as it is supplied by the vagus. That is as far as the nerve supply correlation as far as the mucous membrane is concerned. Whereas when you come to the muscles, already I have told all the muscles of the tongue, you know all that except and all that, all the muscles of the tongue are supplied by hypoglossal nerve, except palatoglossus we say. That is as far as the development of the tongue is concerned. Hello? Hello? Sir. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have I got time? Uh, sir, uh, you have uh, seven minutes now. 